our attitudes are our weapons. Whether we have weak or strong attitudes matter in this life. Warren Wiersbe tells us that outlook determines outcome and the way that we live our life and view each day will determine how we will live that day. And so he encourages us to take upon ourselves this battle that's underway for our soul. Satan wants nothing better than for us to worship him. That began before creation. It continues to this moment. There are two paths. One leads to heaven and one leads to that place prepared for Satan and those who would seek to follow him. One is a wide path leading to eternal damnation. The other is a narrow path, but it leads to eternal life. And we need to develop a mindset, an attitude, so that we are living the way we should. Not very often, Terry and I have the experience to eat at a really nice restaurant. And at some point, if we're there early, just as we're about to eat, the lights will dim. And I make the comment every time, well, the prices just went up. When the lights are down low, you're going to pay a few dollars more. But with that idea in mind, at some point, our eyes get used to the darkness and we're able to read the menu, however shocking it may be. Our eyes adjust to the darkness. And that metaphor is at work in this fourth chapter. We must be certain that we not get used to sin. We must have an attitude toward it, a militant attitude toward sin. I don't like it. It doesn't please my Savior and Lord. And I'm going to do better. Must be our attitude. And certainly we know that God is forgiving. And 1 John 1 verse 9 tells us that when we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us of that sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We're sinning saints even as we become Christians and we need His grace and mercy and His forgiveness often in our life because living the Christian life is not easy. And we must develop an attitude toward sin. And the first attitude that Peter would give us in verse 1, Since, therefore, Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. We are encouraged always to remember what sin did to Jesus. Sin caused him to go to the cross. Sin that separates us from God. Sin that requires an atonement of bringing together of two to make one a covering, a propitiation, another heavy word to use, but it's a covering. What did sin do to Jesus? It necessitated him going to the cross. And Peter is saying, you develop the same mindset that he developed, a courageous attitude a willingness to do whatever it is that's necessary in order to be faithful until that last breath. And it doesn't mean that we're looking to martyrdom. If we lose our life as a result of our belief in Christ, we're just that moment away from eternity. It's not the way we want to end our life, but should it happen like it did with Christ, we are just a moment away from eternity in that circumstance. And if it brings suffering into our life as it did his, 
we understand that because we bear his name, we will suffer for the cause of Christ. And Peter deals with it in the most overt way of most of the Bible writers in the New Testament. His intent is that we persevere. We understand it's real. It involves suffering. Living for Christ is not easy, but it's a path. It's a, a place we choose day by day because we want to spend eternity with him. We want to be where he is one day. And the reality is that we arm ourselves with the same intention, if you will. It's the same intention that Jesus chose for himself. Our goal in life is to cease from sin. It's no longer the habit of my life. That's the whole teaching of the first epistle of John. We're sinning saints. We still need forgiveness. But as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, it necessitates for us an awareness of sin, but it's not any longer the habit of my life. The older I get, I sin less. It's maturity. It's making better choices. It's understanding consequences. There's a long list of reasonings that could be attached to that concept. Peter says it this way, He who has suffered in his body is done with sin. And the reality is it just comes hand in hand. As you become more and more like Christ, sin will be less and less a part of your life. There was a time as a young adult, something was said in a sermon, probably from 1 John, and something was said that we're all sinning saints. And every day we need to be aware of our sin, commission or omission, the things we commit or the things we don't do as Christians. It becomes sin to us if we know to do something and we don't do it. And my mind went immediately to my grandparents on my dad's side. And I thought to myself, are you telling me granddaddy sinned? There's no way. No way. He was such a wonderful Christian man, humble servant, would do anything for any person. And then it kind of hit me, of course, he still had things in his life that he needed to grow in. And of course, as he would sin, however often, whatever it might be, this verse is reminding me that we have the opportunity to be sinless again and again and again and again. Many times in a given day we can confess to God and receive the forgiveness for that action, that thought, that inaction that may be a part of the Christian walk. Have I said it already? The Christian life is not an easy life, I think, four times already. But we're done with sin as it relates to our desire, our goal, our habit. And the suffering can be a proof of that because being a sinless person brings a reaction from the people around us, among us. So we think of what sin did to Jesus. Secondly, verse 2, enjoy the will of God. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. We saw in our basic study this morning on prayer that we pray according to God's will. When we pray, we pray that your will be done, not mine. When we live each day, we live each day with an awareness of what God wants us to do. And we seek to honor the will of God in our life. And so as we look to these verses, as we've suffered, 
And now as we have looked to ourself and we're not pursuing the evil human desires within us or around us, we're seeking God's will for our life. And we never stop doing that. We pray about it. We think about it. We share it with other people. This isn't what God would want me to do. This isn't where God would want me to go. This isn't something God would want me to watch. This isn't something God would want me to read. It involves all aspects of our walk day by day. What does God want me to do? Someone came up with the idea 15 or so years ago with a little 40 cent bracelet that they could sell for three or four dollars, what would Jesus do? Hundreds of thousands of people bought them and they wore them. What would Jesus do? Just the initials. And it reminded people who wore it to think about that day, what would Jesus want me to do? I think those things are still happening I'm not sure where you would find the bracelets any longer. It was a physical fad, but it has a spiritual, uh, spiritual application to us even today. Living according to the will of God for our life. In verse 3, remember what you were before you met Christ. Some of us raised in a Christian environment were pretty good moral people. Let's just say that before we go any further, before we read the verse. But being a good moral person does not save us. Every good moral person still is doing something that God would associate with sin. One sin makes me a lawbreaker. One sin makes me a sinner in need of a Savior. And so no matter how moral we are, that's not what is needed in my life. But Peter acknowledges sometimes the way people live. Some of the Christians to whom he was writing, he said, For you have spent enough time in the past. There's that resting with time. You spend enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do. The word pagan is the one who's not a believer. He doesn't acknowledge God. He doesn't follow Christ. He's outside of God's fellowship. In many cases, pagan related, <clears throat> related to Gentiles, when he was talking to Jewish people of the covenant relationship, but you acted like people who did not know God. And you lived in debauchery and lust and drunkenness and orgies and carousings and detestable idolatry. And there are many, many other things that could be listed here. He's speaking specifically to some of the areas of life some of the Christians participated in to whom he was writing. And it's some of the lowest kinds of sin, sexual perversion, drunkenness, all manner of things described here. Many of these mentioned in the last half of Romans chapter 1, of those who refuse to retain the truth about God and give themselves over to natural desires. The same idea. And then he makes a statement. He wants us to have a patient attitude toward the lost. He says, they think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. Be patient with them because this is going to happen. And it's amazing what we're about to say. There are people who live lives 
seeking to do better, making better choices, trying to live more morally as Christians, trying to behave better toward others, and instead of being appreciative of the better lifestyle that someone is now seeking to live, those that we've partied with, sinned with in the past, point a finger and make fun of us. Come with us Saturday night. You've gone with us for weeks. I don't do that anymore. I don't go to those places anymore. I'm trying to make better choices. And instead of appreciating it, he's telling us you're going to be abused emotionally. And they're going to point a finger and say, you are a strange person. Now, who is the strange person? What is the mirror from that principle from Scripture? The strange person is the one that can appreciate someone trying to do better, live better, be more like the Son of God who came to this earth and set that example. They want you to come with them again. Do the things you used to do. Live the way you used to live. They think you're the strange one. Because you've changed. Have I said it already? Living the Christian life is not easy. And sometimes it's our closest friends that can make it most difficult. Instead of appreciating a change, we're trying to spend more time with family. We're trying to spend our money more wisely. We're trying to keep control of our senses rather than drugs of all kinds. They think we're strange. And he says we need to understand this will take place. It's the process of peer pressure. The first step is we don't do it. The second step is they're surprised. The third step is they mock us. We're the strange ones because we don't do that anymore. And then the fourth one, we're tempted even more to give in to sin because they're making it difficult for us with peer pressure, with words of abuse, to encourage us to keep on doing better. It's called, if you will, the 180 degree turn. Let me read something to you. Christians are an odd bunch. They don't plunge into every party. They go to church when other good people play sports, enjoy the sunshine, or catch up on their sleep. They give money away when other fine people struggle alone to maximize investment potential. I was in a congregation a number of years ago to where one of the song leaders, also a deacon, he said, why don't I ever get to go on really nice vacations? I says, you can figure that out, can't you? How much do you give each Sunday of your combined income, his wife working at the time, to the Lord's work here? I don't want to know, but multiply it by 52 times. And for that three to $8,000, you could have a pretty nice vacation. Oh, yeah. Then he realized it. I'm dedicating part of my income to the Lord's work, and I might not get much of a vacation compared to others my age. Christians pray about matters that are normal, reasonable, level-headed people would gladly sue over. They leave when the party heats up. They seem satisfied with monogamy. A person whose life changes radically at conversion may experience contempt from his or her old friends. He may be scorned not only because he refuses to participate in certain activities, but also because his priorities have changed 
and now he's heading in the opposite direction. And there are times when looking back at our past is not the good thing. And yet Paul encouraged Israel to go back to Egypt and see what he brought them out of. Paul was encouraged to be reminded of how he was a persecutor of the first century Christians. And it encouraged him to do more for the cause of Christ. We must be patient toward those who would mock us because we care about them. We want to encourage them. We want our life not to be set up as a contrast, but as an example, as an encouragement of how life can be lived differently. And Peter is headed to the reality, and it leads to a different eternal life as well. He says in verse 5, they will have to give an account to whom he is ready to judge the living and the dead. I know of people that believe that when we die, that's it. There's nothing else. They're not familiar with scripture. There's not an element of faith that they've heard and accepted. I heard it expressed 20, 30 years ago. They believe that we're like Rover, we die and we're dead all over. It's not that way. Christ rose from the dead. And we too will raise from our death in a spiritual sense and enter into eternity. And that's a time when we will give an account for what we said and done in this life. We will give an account. And we're encouraged with that reality to be ready for that time when we leave this physical life. This morning... We ask a simple question. Are you ready? Are you ready? Should death come into your life this day, this week, this month? We're to give an account. There's things we can do. It's provided to us by a Savior on a cross. And we sing now a song of encouragement, encouraging you to come and make that need known. If we can help you, let's stand and sing a song of encouragement.
precious pleadings of your friends who wish thee well and perhaps before tomorrow you'll be called to meet thy God, O careless soul. O heed the warning, or your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face the judgment. 